fixing to read here, it's important. And I wouldn't even bring it up, I'm, you know, to aggravate anybody if I didn't think it was important. But listen, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Did you catch that? If you don't say that Jesus came in the flesh, you're not speaking of God. Because look, now, did I, did I just make that up? No, look at the next verse. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Oh my goodness. So we're talking about the spirit of Antichrist if you teach Jesus didn't come in the flesh, right? Okay? Now I want to, well, I'll tell you that in a second. And let's see, where, uh, whereof you have heard that it, that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So not only is uh, John's talking about he's coming, well, actually it's already here, guys. That's what John's telling. Him. And it's here today, too. Okay? And then uh, another one in another one in uh, Second John. John's talking again. He says, "For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist." Again, we're finding that to say Jesus doesn't come in the flesh is to be antichrist. Right? That's bad. Okay, so. Let's look at this next verse. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. I wanted to give you all kinds of verses because I don't want you to think that I'm making this up. Okay? I'm not making this up. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So it's, it's pretty big. It's pretty awesome. God was manifest in the what? Flesh. Flesh justified in the Spirit seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up to glory. Jesus was here in the flesh. Not in the Spirit or whatever uh, like some people believe. He was here in the flesh. Alright? Look at Hebrews. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil. So he came, took upon himself what children partake. Now that's important. Look, what is passed on to us from our, by our parents? Our natures. Our flesh, who we are, right? Adam was created so that, and Eve, Adam and Eve together were created so that they could procreate. And what they did was they made, and through God's power, He, de he developed the system so that they would make other creatures like themselves, right? Okay? For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. Right? But quickened by the Spirit. So His death was, His, His flesh was put to death. And then, of course, that's where that other verse we were talking about, where He became a quickening spirit. That's what it's talking about. When it's talking, it's talking about that second Adam is Adam is it is Christ coming out of the tomb. That's the second Adam. Right? Okay? Because he becomes a quickening spirit. Alright, another one. First Peter. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the what? Flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So again, we see Christ is in the flesh. It's not, there's no argument here. The Bible's very plain. He's in the flesh, right? Okay. Here's the kicker, though. Some people have invented, okay, let me go back. The, there came a schism in the church. Uh, a group called the Gnostics 
were teaching that Christ came in the spirit, not in the flesh. And, and there was a lot of different. There were a lot of different Gnostics. They taught a lot of different things. But one group actually taught that Christ didn't come in the flesh, but he came in the spirit. And John and 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 we see Paul. They were combating this doctrine. Now, this doctrine came from the Greeks. What it was is the Gnostic or Gnosis is Greek for knowledge, and they come up with this philosophy and what they were doing was they were marrying their philosophy with any religion that came along. I mean they didn't have a problem with it. They, any religion came along they would just scoot it into their philosophy. Well the Christian church had to combat this lie that was coming in. And so what they ended up doing, John makes it real clear, Jesus came in the flesh. So what do people do to get around Paul and, and, and John's very clear statement that Jesus came in the flesh, they make up another kind of flesh. They say, well, yeah, he came in the flesh, but he didn't come into the flesh that we have. He came in the flesh uh, that Adam had before the fall. And they invent, invent what they call the Immaculate Conception. And the Immaculate Conception is the belief that Mary was conceived by her mother and father who were both sinful, but God interrupted the flow of the fallen nature so that Jesus or Mary would not have the fallen nature and therefore whenever she gave birth to Jesus, he also would not have the fallen nature. What comes out of this? Two things. One, Mary is now on a pedestal. She is above us and she's starting to look like something you can venerate, right? That's not good. And the second thing is, is we have Christ who is a little bit further away from us. Right? But look at this verse. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the what? Flesh. Guess what, guys? That word right there, it's the same word. It's the same word. All those verses, well, all the New Testament verses that I gave you, it's the same exact Greek word. I looked it. I looked it. Okay? It's the same word. So, if this weak flesh right here is not the flesh that Jesus came in, why didn't they use a different word? Or at least have a different word with it. Glorified flesh or uh, the, per the perfect flesh or the flesh before the fall. But they don't do that, guys. They... They say flesh, and they mean flesh. There's no argument here. If there is, you're making it up. Look at this. God sending His own Son in the likeness of what? Now they're going to get a little more specific, just in case you didn't get it. The sinful flesh. Now some people might argue, well, it says likeness. See, yeah, it's like it, but it's not really. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no. Just because it says likeness doesn't mean that it means not like it. That doesn't make sense, does it? Likeness that's not like it. Come on, guys. Look at here, right here. And Adam liveth, live, liveth a hundred and thirty years and begotten a son in his likeness. According to his image, Seth looked like his daddy. When it says likeness, it doesn't mean not likeness. It means likeness. So when it says here that he came, uh, that he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, it means he had the sinful flesh. Okay? Now, does that mean he was sinful? No. And I'll show you that. Look at here. I don't know if I'm going to show it yet because I don't remember what slides it. For we have, uh, listen here, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. What are infirmities? Weaknesses. We don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, he understands our weaknesses. How does he understand them? But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Did you catch that? He was tempted like every single one of us, except he didn't sin. Now, look, it's not a temptation if it's not a temptation. Why do we make this hard? Okay, a temptation is something you want to do. It's not something that you don't want to do.